once again, I'd like to say welcome to Monument Baptist Church and happy Mother's Day. You know, we've been talking about and going through, uh, you know, <laughs> excuse me. There we go. <laughs> if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and turn to 1 Samuel, chapter 1. This would be the, the Mother's Day passage of Scripture, and for, for years I, I try not to preach it because it seems as if this is our, our go-to passage of Scripture. And as I was trying to prepare for, for family, for mothers, for, for children... I was kept being drawn back to this passage of Scripture, so that's where we're going to be this morning. You know, Scripture is full of a lot of examples for us. You know, we have examples on how we can live our life, how we can have joy, how we can have peace, how we can be a family, how to treat each other, how not to treat each other, when to speak and when not to speak. Uh, scripture on, on how to be a good brother, a good sister, a good father, and of course, a good mother. And so in 1 Samuel, we see an example of a mother who, who put not just her child, but her whole family, her, her whole life in God's hands because she knew that God was capable of doing what was best for them. You know, I'm, I'm a father. I have one son, and, and he's Logan, and he's 22, and there's nothing I wouldn't do for my, for my son. And I know for... for my wife, Diana, there's nothing she wouldn't do for her child. As parents, God has gifted us and blessed us if we're parents with children. Sometimes we don't always look at them as being a gift. We're being real honest, and I see someone just pushing their daughter's head away. Um, because it's, it's a challenge. If, if you're a parent, is it a challenge being a parent? You, you know... <laughs> Some of them say it very vehemently. You know, the problem that, that I see as a single, single child is that they don't come with instructions. I'm one of, of five, really one of eight, but one of five that actually grew up as a family unit. And there's not one of us five that anyone could look at. I mean, you can look at Roy and say we look alike, but we're all different. We all have different personalities. We all have different likes and dislikes. Um, if you were to talk to my mother, she would definitely say that we're all unique. We're all unique. And as, as, as a parent, I know my son is unique, but also as a child, I know that I'm unique as well. And so really, if we call ourselves followers of Christ and we call ourselves Christians, then we really need to know what God says about life. And about parenting. And this morning, mothers, it's about being a mom. But you have to understand that it's not just for moms. The principles in 1 Samuel chapter 1 apply to, to fathers, to husbands, to grandparents. We kind of get it all, but we're going to pick on moms this morning. But not really pick, I hope bless, because God's word blesses when we, when we hear it blesses us when we listen to it. So I'm going to begin in verse 1 of 1 Samuel, chapter 1, and I'm, I, I'm going to read bits and pieces and tell you, fill in the story. It begins, Now there was a certain man from, from Ramathaim Zophim, from the hill country of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, and Ephraim. Fight. Don't you like those big words? An Ephraim fight. He was from Ephraim. He had two wives. I'll get back to that. The one, <laughs> the name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Penina, or Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Now, we have to understand the, the day and the age. God's design was never for a, a, a man to have more than one wife. Uh, he allowed it for whatever purpose, but go to Deuteronomy, and you can read uh, Paul's writings. Um, it's, it's not in our best interest, guys, to have two wives. <laughs> 
And wives, it's not in your best interest to, to have another wife to have to contend with. Is that a good word, contend? So, so we see something from the outset of this. There's a problem just in the family unit because there's two wives and one husband. And the reason there were two wives and one, hus one husband, Hannah was the first wife, but Hannah could bear no children. And if you didn't have children, then you didn't have a future for your name. And so Elkanah married Penina or Penina. I always think Penina is a sandwich, so I can't go that way. So Penina, and she bore the first children. And because she was his wife as well, there was some contention between Hannah and the other wife. And the other wife, Pen Penina, Penina, sorry about that, um, she began to ridicule and belittle and make fun of Hannah. And Hannah was to the place where she was beside herself, to say the least, disturbed, discouraged, angry, downtrodden, brokenhearted. And we can imagine why she'd be brokenhearted. I mean, she couldn't have children. But besides that, her husband took another wife. I, at least in our culture, that would hurt a lot. And so she did what mothers and parents and Christians need to do. She cried out to God. Let me read what comes up now. I did all this con confrontation, all this stuff. Verse 6 says, Her rival, however, would provoke her bitterly to irritate her. She did it intentionally. To irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So here's, here's something to kind of put in your, your, the back of your mind. God allowed this. God allowed Hannah not to be able to bear children. He does that. He's sovereign. God can do what God wants to do. Everyone say Amen. Because God can do what God wants to do, and there is nothing we can do about what God wants to do other than be faithful. So she was beside herself. Verse 7 says, it happened year after year, so it was a way of life for her. Do you imagine every day waking up feeling less than you are? feeling like you had not accomplished what you thought you could accomplish or, or what your friends thought you could accomplish or your spouse thought you could accomplish or your parents thought you could accomplish. Could you imagine waking up every day and feeling like a failure? There are people that live that way. That's kind of the picture of Hannah. She woke up every day knowing that she couldn't give what she wanted to give. Verse 8 says, then El Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Or why is your heart broken? Am I not better to you than ten sons? Aren't I enough, honey? Aren't I enough? We don't need kids. It's enough. But it wasn't for Hannah. Then Hannah rose, verse 9, after eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She, greatly distressed, prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly or wept bitter tears. Tears of frustration. Verse 11 said, she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. And a razor shall never come to his head. What a vow. What a request. God, give me a son so I can give him back to you. God, bless me. With a child, not just a child, with a son, because that in, in that culture, that, 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 that was what you wanted. You wanted a, a son. You wanted a boy. And so she was praying very specifically to God, saying, God, bless me with a child. Bless me with a son. 
And then the kicker is, bless me with the son, God, and I will, I will make a vow to you that he will be yours forever. Would you do that with your children? Could you do that sitting right here right now, thinking or looking at your children and go, I want what God wants for my child no matter what? That's a hard prayer to pray. Because when you pray like that and you think like that and you believe like that, then you have to trust God for what God does in the life of your child. Now think about that for a second. If your child is just getting out of high school, have you picked a college for them to go to? Have you picked a profession that you wish they would pursue? In a lot of nations, in a lot of countries, um, the parents decide what the child is going to become professionally before the child ever learns to walk. And so they begin that child's life by, by I'm going to use the word program, program, programming the child so that they'll be a doctor or a politician or a scientist, which is a doctor, but you know what I mean. And so the child knows from, from the moment they can even begin to think that this is what they're going to become. And, you know, maybe that's not a bad thing if, if the parents prayed for, before the child was born and as the child was, was, was being developed, for God's will and surrendered their child to the will of God. But unfortunately, as parents, we kind of like what we like for our kids, right? No? How many of you like what you like for your kids? Of course. Because we want the very best for our children. But the example we see here is that the best for our children is for them to be in the hands of God. For them to be in the will of the Father. And as parents and as moms, you guys get to set that up from before the time they're even born or maybe even conceived, saying, Lord, you're blessing me with, with this gift, with this child. But God, I'm giving this gift, I'm giving this child, whether it be a boy or be, whether it be a girl, God, I'm giving this child back to you because I want what you want for my child. And then we have some ways to pray as parents. God, help me not to interfere in your way. That's hard too. Because again, we want what we want for our children. And we all want our, the best for our children, right? And so we begin to pray in a way that, that unless we've actually given them to the Lord, that becomes selfish. And that's a tough place to be with God. Because when we want what we want for our children and it conflicts with what God wants for our children, then we're at odds with God. <laughs> and that's a bad place for us to be, at odds with God. So Hannah's example here is, Lord, if you'll give me a child, I'll give him back to you. And she, she went a step further. A Nazarite was a very specific, very special um, calling, if you will. Samson was a, a Nazarite, and it meant that you never cut your hair, and there were a lot of other things. You didn't drink um, wine, and you, you, it's all kinds of things, but a Nazarite vow oftentimes was just for a, a period of time. It did, just because you were a Nazarite and took the vow didn't mean you were, you were that forever, but Hannah was basically making that vow that whatever God wanted to do, he's going to be for you. That's a pretty big commitment to want a child so bad and then go, well, here, Lord, whatever you want. Could we do that? Could we? And not even take him back to the temple. <laughs> that, I don't, I'm not sure any of us could do that. But could we say, Lord? Moms, could you say, Lord? I want the very best for my kid, for my kids, for my children. So God, I'm, 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 I'm metaphorically laying them at your feet, laying him, laying her at your feet. And God, do what you want to do, what you need to do. 
in their lives. And God, help me to be okay with that. That's a hard one. I think one of the, the strongest things that we as parents get to do is, is we get, we know what life's about on a certain plane, on a certain level. We certainly don't have all the answers, but we can desire God's will for our children. And so we can pray that way. Pray for God to do His work in their lives, but let's not neglect ourselves. Pray for God to do His work in our lives so that we'll be the parents for our kids. We'll be the fathers. We'll be the mothers for our children. Verse 12, now it came about as she continued praying to the Lord. So see, that, that's what she's doing. She, she's not just throwing a fit. She's not just throwing a tantrum. She's just not, not just screaming at her husband. She's not screaming at the preacher or the priest. She's crying out to God, and she's weeping bitterly. We just read that. But she continues praying before the Lord, and the priest sees her. Eli is watching her and watching her mouth. Now, in that day and age, most of the public prayer was audible. And so if there were a bunch of people, you'd hear a lot of people praying. But her mouth was moving, but there was no sound coming out. And so I'm going to paraphrase this. He goes, shame on you for being drunk in God's house. <laughs> How dare you defile yourself by coming into God's house drunk? She's like, whoa, wait a minute, buddy. Hold on. He said, I'm not drunk. Let me read this, verse 15. No, my Lord, I am a, a woman oppressed in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant as a worthless woman, for I have spoken until now out of my great concern and provocation. Priest, you just don't understand. See, we, this is, we all have our opinions. We see, we see things and we, we make judgments. Well, so did the priest. Maybe we should just be careful what we say and what we do when we don't have all the facts. That's a side note. Then Eli said, verse 17, Go in peace and may the God of Israel grant your petition that you have asked. And then she said, let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the women, woman went, to, went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. You know, there's, there's a reality that, that we, we get to live in, that when we submit and commit and give things over to the Lord, He can give us peace. He can give us hope, and He can give us joy. He can affirm that what we're doing is the right thing to do. The evidence is the fact that she did this. She made this huge vow. She was confronted by the priest who didn't know what he was talking about. And if you know the story of, of Eli and his sons, they were horrible priests. That's part of the reason Samuel was, was born in the first place. So she was misunderstood, but she came out of that whole meeting with a smile on her face. See, God does that for us, and he can do that for us if, if we allow him to. But it really is about a relationship. It's about a walk. It's about, about making pro, a prayer a priority in our life, communing and communicating with God as, as a priority. So moms and dads, I challenge you, pray for your kids. Pray for your grandkids. I, I cannot, I would be almost beside myself if I thought that a Christian uh, parent or grandparent didn't pray for their grandchildren. I mean, you guys, there's grandparents here, right? Let's, do you pray for your grandchildren? Absolutely. I pray for my son every single day. And you probably pray for your grandchildren and your children every single day. That's what we get to do. And I say, thank you, Lord. He allows us to go before him and petition and request. And so as, as followers of Christ, we get to give them to him and say, Lord, just take them. And sometimes we want to say, Lord, just take them. 
and do something with them. Because we're all unique, we're all special. Verse 19 says, Then they rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord and returned again to their, to their house in Ramah. And Elkanah had relations with Han, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Answered prayer. Answered prayer. Verse 20, it came about in due time after Hannah had conceived that she gave birth to a son and she named him Hannah saying, because I have asked of the Lord. She gave God credit for everything. God was in the forefront of her life. Listen to what happens next. Then the man, Elkanah, the husband, went up with all, the, all his household to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up. For she said to her husband, I will not go up until the, until the child is weaned, and then I will bring him that he may appear before the Lord and stay there dun, 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 forever. And, and Elkanah said, no way, lady, I'm the husband. This ain't going to happen. We've been waiting way too long for this. He's staying with us. Oh, hold it. That's the other book. Elkano says, honey, do what you think is best. Do what you think is best. Husbands, think about that for a minute. Honey, I'm going to do what I know I'm supposed to do. You do what you're supposed to do. Communication. We're in this together. As much as Hannah showed faith and Hannah showed, showed moxie, Elkanah did too. We might talk about that at Father's Day. This is about mothers. But again, in the culture, the wife could not have fulfilled the vow unless her husband allowed her to. I know we don't think that way anymore. But back then, the wife couldn't just do what the wife wanted to do. And so basically, he's giving her his blessing. Verse 23 says, Elkanah her, Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Remain until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord confirm his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until he was weaned. He said, Honey, do, do what, you're, what you know you're supposed to do, and may the Lord bless you. I trust God. Honey, you, you trust God. You're going to be a mom, Hannah. God's going to bless you with a child. Be faithful. And he was faithful as well. Verse 24 says, Now when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with a three-year-old bull and some flour and a jug of wine and brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh, although the child was young. They slaughtered the bull and brought the boy to Eli, the priest. And she said, oh, my Lord, as your soul lives, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. For this boy, I prayed. And the Lord has given me my petition. He's given me my heart's desire. He's given me what I've asked for. He's given me a gift. So I've also dedicated him to the Lord. I'm giving my gift as a gift to the Lord. I'm giving him back. What an example. What an example for, for a mom. What an example for a dad. Again, not necessarily taking them to the church and dropping them off. Please don't do that. <laughs> Different times. <laughs> but give them back to the Lord. I've also dedicated him to the Lord, verse 28, as long as he lives, 
He is, des des he is dedicated to the Lord. And then she did something that we get to do. And it says, and he worshiped the Lord there. See, I would think it would be, and she worshiped the Lord there. But Samuel learned about God. He learned about life from the Creator. He learned about life as the Savior. Pressed to Him. He was taught the ways of God. See, I would say, see, and, and, and she worshiped there. She probably did also. But I don't believe there's any mistakes in Scripture. And I, I went back and I looked. And, you know, when you start looking at the Hebrew, we have, we have to be careful. I, I'm not a scholar. I'm not a Hebrew scholar. I don't think there's any Hebrew scholars in here. But there are no vowels in Hebrew. And everything's read backwards. And so I went back and looked here, thinking that it should be, and she worshiped there but it's he. And so his mom gave him to God so that Samuel could worship God. What an awesome testimony. So what if, what if moms, if, you know, maybe you haven't prayed for your children for a while. Maybe you're at odds with your kids. I hope and pray you're not. But this morning, you can change all of that. And it begins with a simple prayer. Can I give you a simple prayer? Well, I guess I can. I think I will. Let's do this. Here's how you can pray. Lord, number one, God, change me. God, shape me and mold me into the person you want me to be. God, you've entrusted or you're entrusting me with the life of another person. Your unique creation. So God, as you're changing me, draw me to yourself so that I can give the gift of my children, the gift of my child, back to you. God, may I be faithful in praying for them. May I be faithful in teaching them. May I be faithful in setting an example of what it means to be a lover of God. God, may I share my, my, my relationship with you to them. And above all, God, let them see Jesus in me. Help my actions to, be, to speak louder than my words. God, stop me when I need to be stopped. God, help me to be quiet when I need to be quiet. Help me to speak when I need to speak. But God, help me. You can't raise a Christian child as a Christian without God. We live in a secular world, a fallen world that wants us to believe something different than what the Word of God teaches. The Bible says it's a narrow way, it's a narrow path. But if you're a Christian, if you're a believer in, in Jesus Christ and you've surrendered your life to Him, then you've already made that choice to walk in the ways of God. So, Mom, it begins with you. Dad, it begins with you. Grandma and Grandpa, it begins with you too. We get to live for God. There's a lot of scripture that says what a blessing children are. 
what a blessing parents are. Honestly, we all can be blessings. Do you feel like a blessing? Do this this week. This is the last thing and I'm done. Bless someone. Do something for someone just because. And maybe, maybe it's, it's your ch- children that you need to do it for. Maybe you just need to pick up the phone and say, you know, I was thinking about you today and I, I just, I prayed for you. I'm sending you a package. Maybe it's walking into their room and saying, you know, I don't get it right all the time. Don't we like being right, parents, all the time? I can tell you this from experience. Admitting that we don't have it all together all the time pays dividends for our children, no matter what age they are. See, because we know our kids are a work in progress, but a lot of times we don't want them to understand that we're still a work in progress. God's still working on me. And I'm 55 years old, and I've got a lot to learn. I'll be dead before I learn it all, because I won't ever learn it all. But we get to learn. I'm going to ask if you'll stand this morning. I'll never forget growing up, I was 11 years old, and most of you, a lot of you know this, was raised by a very abusive father, and my mother took, there were four of us at the time, in the middle of the night, and put us on an airplane. Saved our lives. And we went and hid for months, so that my father couldn't get to us. I'll never forget that. My mom's in assisted living. Most of you know that. She's not the same mom. She is, but... But she loved her kids. And saved us so that we could be the people that God wants us to be. Guys, honor your moms today. Honor your grandmothers. Tell them you love them, and then show them you love them. Because God has blessed you with the family that you've got. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I give thanks for the life that you have blessed me with, for the family that you've blessed me with, for the mom that you've blessed me with. Father, for my wife, who is the mother of of Logan, and Father, for for all that you have given us, and Lord, I know you've done the same for, for almost everyone in this room, or you will do that. And so, God, I pray that we would faithfully surrender our children and surrender our lives to you that we would with intention seek you, learn about you, love you, and follow you in obedience. Lord, it's never too late to start. So God, I pray that each of us would would surrender our lives to you and allow you to foster a relationship with us, with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, on the throne of our lives. And may we live for you. May we give not just our children to you, but everything that we have and everything that we are. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We're going to sing a song of invitation, a song of commitment. You know, I don't know how the Lord has spoken to you this morning. Maybe he's not said anything to you this morning. But if he's spoken to you, if he's prompting you, if he's leading you, would you simply be faithful? Do what he's leading you to do. Do what you feel like he's telling you to do. Maybe you need to come down and 
and let me pray with you. Maybe you need someone to talk to. Now is the time to do it. We're going to sing a song, and it's I Surrender All. Good song. The words will be on the screen. There's sheet music in your bulletins. You probably know it. Would you sing it with all your heart and mean it?